Hey everybody, welcome to Wood Chat for August 29, 2012. I'm Matt Gradwall from Uppercut Woodworks. You can find me on the web at uppercutwoodworks.com and on Twitter at Uppercut Wood. With me tonight is my buddy Chris. Hello, my name's Chris Wong. You can find me on Twitter at Flair Woodworks and my website, flairwoodworks.com. Joining us today here is Brian. How you doing, guys? Brian Van Vreede of uh, Bucks County Craftmasters. Find me on Twitter at uh, BC Craftmaster, or follow the hashtag with the builds, which is BVV Craftmaster. BVV. Yeah, Brian Van Vreede. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so if you're watching the video and you want to follow along on the text chat, go to uppercutwoodworks.com/woodchat/chatroom. And if you're following along on Twitter, you're not listening to me, so I'm not going to give you instructions <laughs> on how to watch the video. Um, so today is a design jam, right, Chris? That's correct, yes. So you want to explain to everybody kind of what a design jam is? Design jam is, well, what we do in a design jam is we, t we pick a few designs from a few designs or projects that you, the wood cheddars, have made or drawn up, and we present them to you and allow you to comment, critique, ask questions, and it's basically a chance for everybody, the maker, everyone, and everyone else to learn together. So today we've got a few different uh, projects. First one is from Brian, and he's built a he's building a bench. He's in the final stages. He's at fuming, which we talked about last week, I do believe. Yeah. Um, it's not it's it's not just at fuming just yet. There's been a couple. Uh, we kind of changed yeah. the, the look of the arms. I don't know if you saw that picture yet. Um, the direction they were, we flip-flopped them from right to left. So I have to redo the mortises and redo the way that they connect into the uh, the back leg. Okay, is that the big change that you were saving for, chat? Yeah, that's that's the big change. So it's... it's okay. it, 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 the arms now make it look a little bit more welcoming. When you When you look at it, it looks like it wants to hold you in instead of the arms displaying to the outside, it kind of spitting you out. So nice. we, we, we just tried it, and we looked at it, and we, it looked better. So we, we had to do it. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's, that's what I do. If it looks better, go for it. Yeah. It's all, all experimentation. That's right. So you got pictures of this change that you made? Yes. Put in the screen share? No. Now that I don't have, Brian, you have to, you have to fend for yourself right. there. Have okay. you got them? And, and just to be clear, buy, this is not a the... workbench. This no, is this not a Rubo. Is... No, oh, it's like a thoughtful. A... This is a, a a sitting bench. Like a child, it's for a child. So it's uh, it could still fit. Like me and my brother could probably sit on it, and it would. It's definitely not going to fall apart or anything. But it's that size. I think it's thirty inches long. Okay. I'm trying to find a picture right now. I'll show you. And is there work holding for cutting dovetails on this bench? No. <laughs> No vices or anything like that. No dog holes? No dog holes either. <laughs> There's draw boring holes, but that's about picture. it. And if I can screenshot the right picture. There you go. So, Brian, this is before you flip the arms? Correct. This is before we flip the arms, yeah. Okay. So they're now with okay. the, that that inside curve on the inside, that scoop. Correct, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I, li I like that. I like, th I like that idea. All right, I'm putting it up in uh, wood jet right now. Okay. So, it, it shouldn't take too long. We already started it. We cut it a little bit of it off. Um, basically, the arm has to get shortened by about an inch and a half because before it used to wrap around the back leg and then we were going to peg it through the leg but since we want to switch sides we have to shorten it because otherwise how the arm would wrap around it would wrap around to the inside which would get in the way of the raised panel it wouldn't look right mm. wrapping to the inside so now it's just going to butt into the leg and it's going to be uh, it's going to be held in there with like two hidden dowels that are going to go into the arm and into the leg so it's definitely not going to move horizontally. Right? Horizontal dowels. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you thought of using a domino 
Are you a domino guy? Yeah, I don't have a domino. No. Neither do I. I was waiting for somebody to say, just use your domino. So, figured I'd throw it out there. I try. And I don't avoid... think it's necessary there. With the domino? No, I don't think it's required there. No, you I don't, could I don't... it? I don't think it. No, it's fine. Stick with the dowels. Yeah, that's all. I, I avoid addictions, so I'm not. I'm not stepping into the fest tool realm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Did it come up there in the? Uh... Was it a link? I just I tweeted a picture of it to Woodchat. No, I didn't see it. it. Look, it looks like it's going. Look, it might be going slow tonight, though. The t Twitter might be going slow. Oh, it it would help if I spelt Woodchat correctly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I was gonna say. I, tw I tweeted Wadchat. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it's not gonna make it on Wadchat. What did you say? W O D. I forgot the other O. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's the workout of the day chat for CrossFit CrossFit addicts. Sure it is. So, have you haven't flipped the arms yet, but you're going to. It's in the process. Yeah, we just. Okay. I mean, I probably only worked on it for like 45 minutes after work tonight. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, for our Saturday, we should be starting the fuming. Definitely building the tent and everything like that, starting the fuming. Um, so what did you find out about fuming since last time? Since we, talk, we talked about that a, a lot last time. and I know somebody sent a link about, I think it was Lee Nielsen or Lee Valley had a, a website about fuming. Yeah, I'm, I haven't, I, I've just basically been going off the two fine woodworking articles that I got offline. Um, I've got the ammonia. I just picked up that today. It doesn't have a percentage on the side of the bottle, yeah. but it's definitely it's definitely industrial strength, and it has a number. I got to call the number if I want to find out the percentage. But I picked up that, yeah. and I picked up a set of uh, the proper cartridges for the 3M respirator. Good. So, and that was like nineteen dollars for the two things. I'm gonna put oh, a wow. picture of the bench in the in in right now. Because this looks like this is what you're doing with the. Um, this looks like you've moved the arms in this picture. Yeah, it's this isn't exactly where they're going to yeah. sit on top of the the legs. Right. It'll, it'll be moved out a little bit, but it it just gives. I think it gives a more welcoming. I agree. I think that's bench. a good. Yes. A very good change. Yeah, it looks a lot better. Yeah. yeah. So was this your own design? Did you go off plans? Were you inspired by a different design? This was kind of off. Uh, this was my own plans. Um, I think Chris. I think you, do you have those pictures of? Yeah, uh, yeah. they're coming. Okay. Here you go. This is this was the original. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one. Uh, let's try it again. Did I close the right window? No, I got, so I have it there. You're on the assembled one. There you go. How's that? Yeah, that's that's the original my my original sketch. Yeah. So I was basically just looking for the the dimensions, the just the, yeah, the overall dimensions. And I was also that's a great way to start. And I was also initially thinking slats in the beginning and not the raised panels. Yeah. Which I think Chris was the one who talked me out of the slats. Yeah. And that's yes, toy storage. Um, slats were in the second drawing. Yeah, toy storage. It's a it's plenty of room to fit shoes, someone said, uh, toys, games, whatever, books. It's interesting. In this picture here, it looks like you do have the arms coming in. Hmm. In this yeah, little, point, yeah. Yeah, the, that, they're kind of just straight in that one. I didn't... Yeah. The arms were kind of a design-as-I-went kind of thing. I had no idea how they were going to be shaped or anything like that. Yeah. And, once I shaped the arms, I think that really dictated all the other shapes with the piece and the way we went with the legs and <laughs> rounding everything over. I like how they're pillowed like that, rounded over. I think that looks really, um, really soft. You're not gonna you're resting your elbow on that. You're it's not you're not gonna dig into a corner. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. If we can go back for a minute here. Um, 
when you're designing a piece that's supposed to be functional, I find it really helpful to first um, establish your overall dimensions, and then you basically build an imaginary box. So Brian's box is 14 and a half by 28 inches by I'm not sure it's 32 inches. So he got his dimensions there, and then he started filling in that box. He needed a seat, he needed a backrest and armrest. Yeah. And once you have those first dimensions, you can go go from there. It's quite easy actually. Because I at first uh, I was actually trying to go basically straight to this drawing you're showing now, and it was <laughs> it, it was horrible. The proportions were not were not good at all. So I just figured yeah. out yeah the size that I wanted first, and then went from there. Uh, question from the chat room. Tim Charles wants to know if it's one big compartment underneath. Yeah, yeah, it's one big compartment under there. It's got a, uh, I think it's seven sixteenths inch, or I'm sorry, uh, it's a thirteen sixteenths inch panel at the bottom of uh -huh. uh, same, same thing. Everything on this is quarter sawn oak except for the dowels, which is which is wange, but it's a nice thick piece of oak down there. Um, in you know, dados down there, so it's not going anywhere. Cool. So you got pet. So in this drawing, you had panels in the bottom and slats at the top, which I thought was kind of clashing. So I recommended uh, panels up top, bottom, and yeah. that resulted in this sketch here. You mind if we skip one, Brian? Yeah, you it's fine. Go back to sketch three first. No, it's fine. I mean, that I think that's when I made the change. I had the uh, the one above it on sketch three. Yes, yeah. He had some, some pretty cool uh, curvy slats in this one here. And I actually, those, the curvy slats were a complete takeoff of a, uh, it's a bench in the Arts and Crafts book for popular woodworking. It's a, mm -hmm. oh, it's a okay. green, green style bench, and I, I thought that bench was awesome. And I love the slats, and I was trying to mimic it, and it does, it does clash with the bottom. I like that you're actually sketching in paper. So many people feel like they have to quickly get to digital. Yeah. And you don't have to quickly get to digital. You don't. You don't actually have, ever have to get to digital if you don't want to. Yeah. I mean, I I, I did Google SketchUp once on uh, my first table build that I did, and it worked okay. But I don't think you need all of those details. I mean, some of it is just it, it's put the piece of wood up there and see what fits between your legs and mark it that way rather than saying relative it, dimensioning exactly yeah it's it makes a complete difference and it makes everything fit exactly instead of getting down the line and having all your pieces cut at once which is what I did when I did SketchUp I cut everything at once and it was it was frustrating actually yeah I can see that and sketching is actually a great way to um, help you visualize and figure out what kind of curves, what kind of shapes you like with uh, minimal commitment. It takes 10 seconds to draw a curved line, but to cut it into ferret with a bounce on a spoke shape takes a lot more a lot more time. Yeah, definitely. And I, I find CAD, I'm, I'm not entirely proficient with CAD. I find it slow as well. Um, I, suppose, I think that if you're doing multiple pieces, you need to get the design perfect, or you need to, to get it approved by a client. CAD definitely has its benefits, but for the work I do, for one-off stuff, I prefer just uh, sketches or going straight to the wood. It's, it's interesting because um, there's two types of manufacturing processes or development process. One is um, deterministic, and the other is empirical. So most of the work that woodworkers do is empirical. That's the first time you design something. And then as soon as you're going to build multiples of that, it's deterministic. Right? So um, the, the classic example is people who, like, if you're going to build a car. Uh, the first shape of the doors or the body is done in clay. And it's, you know, and you're, you know, does it look right? Does it look right? Does it look right? And they're shaving and shaving and shaving. Now, I think, use, right. I think they use less clay now and they use more CAD. Hmm. And that's empirical where you have to go through lots of iterations. But as soon as they know what the car door is going to look like, building the first one is hard. But then the rest, they can optimize, 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 right? Yeah. Yes. And yeah. we never get to that point <laughs> unless you're going to be going to 
unless you're going to be IKEA, right? You mass produce it, yeah. Yeah, unless you're going to mass produce it. So the empirical design process is so important, and so the the sketching, prototyping, um, making things out of pink foam and carving that and hot gluing it together is is really really important. Do you ever do uh, full scale models or anything? I mean, I've I have people do. They buy secondary woods and they do full scale models. I don't I don't know yeah. if I have the patience for for it. Um, I've done it on things where proportion is really really important, and and I don't but I don't do it out of like a secondary wood. Okay. Uh, I'll do it out of like the foam insulation panels. Oh, okay. Uh, Rob Boas did that for his walnut desk, and it worked out really really well because. He realized that like the desk height wasn't right, or that it didn't fit right into the corner, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but even though you can get a good 3D visualization out of SketchUp, it's 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 not fully there when you. It's not as good as even constructing something crudely with hot glue and pink foam panels. <laughs> um, yeah. Where you can you can sit at it with a chair, you can rest your elbows on it, you can see how it fits into the room, you can see the proportion of the different pieces. The rendering is is good, but it's kind of fake, you know. Yeah. It's um. And and then the the foam panels are recyclable, so you just bust them up and put them in your recycling, and you're and you're done. And they're cheap. Yeah. Um. And you can just hot glue gun them together, but um. But and you know you um, you can use one of those um, oh it's kind of like a drywall saw it's like a it's like a serrated knife yeah you know, to cut it and curves and you can do whatever you want and you're and you're good to go so if you do a lot of that I know they use uh, like hot wire have you ever seen that yeah I've seen those but it's not worth right through it yeah. that that's better for uh, cushy foam like for upholsters yeah. for cushy foam. Yeah. The pink stuff you can just cut. Yeah. It's not that hard. You can run it through a table saw, no problem. <laughs> so. And it's so, easy to run a full panel through a table saw with no outfeed support. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, like a pound. The whole thing was like a pound. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, Matt. You said that you don't use secondary woods for your mock ups. And I was thinking, yeah, me too. I use primary woods. <laughs> yeah, for your mock ups. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Carbon fiber. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true, I do. It's just, I guess, one of the luxuries of having enough wood that I can play with and knowing that I can play with my, my mock-up until it looks good. So I don't really mock... I guess I mock stuff, stuff off in real life. I don't know how to describe that. You probably... You know that you're going to... You always leave yourself room to, uh, to modify things a little bit or shape it down. Yeah. If, you, yeah. if you stay a little bit heavy on all your parts, like I kind of did that with the arms of the, uh, the chair... They were really oversized blanks to begin with, and I cut the mortises, fit them on top of the leg, and then cut the notch to wrap it around the back of the leg, and then spent a lot of time trying to work out that shape on the arm. Right, yeah. And I guess that's a good example, because you shaped your arms the way you thought you wanted them. Yeah. And you looked at it, then you decided, this isn't quite right. Yeah. So you flipped them around, and then now you're... Now it's the right. same shape, it's way. just which, which way they curve out. Mm -hmm. That's right. How did you shape them? How did you pillow them? Well, <laughs> after, I, after I cut out the first shape on the bandsaw, I was uh, I tried to use my belt sander. So I used the belt sander to get the initial shape, and that was... It, it, <laughs> it, it's like a stationary belt sander, so I was just I was able to hold the wood, but it it left sharp corners. It wasn't pillowed at all. It was had yeah. like it, it rounded over a little bit at the ends, but it didn't completely round over. And I ended up doing that completely with a uh, with the rasp and then random orbital sander. So, hey, a wood shaver just asked a, a really good question. Just, have Have any of you guys ever done a full size drawings? Yeah, like really full size. Yeah. Now, when I do a full-size drawing, it's only for a limited component. Um, what I've often done is uh, for coopering. I want to know what angles to make all all my my staves to get the right the right uh, curvature of my uh, coopered chest lid that it has been in the past. That's what math is for. 
rather than use this thing called math, but I, I draw my curve and then I just bisect those angles and then I cut them to fit. Yeah. yeah. It's works for nice me. Nice to be able to see it in full size too. You get a real oh, yes. a better sense of the proportions of everything. Mm -hmm. I occasionally do a full size drawing for um, angle joinery too, but only if I have a reference surface and Recently, I haven't had any reference surfaces, so I don't bother with that drawing. So I'm Brian trying to find. I'm trying to find it, but at some point, oh, here it is. Some point, I write, I wrote a piece of software to help me with those angles. Okay. I'll show it you. I'll show it to you really quick if it still works. It's pretty sounds, old. Sounds complicated. It it is. It's math, and there's angles and Greek letters in it and stuff like that. Oh, geez. I need to know um, Greek first. Do you guys do you guys want do you guys know uh, Matthias Wandel or I don't know how you say his name from YouTube? Wood Wood Gears. Uh, Wood Gears .ca. Um, this might not run. We'll see. So he had done some um, segmented bowls. Right. Yes. Right. Where you might have ten or twelve segments, and then it comes down, so the angles change, and he he did the math there. Ah, uh, boy, it doesn't look like it's going to run, and I probably just shut down my machine in a bad way. Um, you know, I, think, I think there was a whole there was a whole thing in the new fine woodworking about segment segmented turning. And, uh, and the math was, involved? Yeah, yeah, I think there was. Hmm. That would be cool. Um, is that it? Anyway, I, I, I'm writing an app. I'm writing something to do the whole. Oh, here it is. Here it is. I'm writing something to do the math, um, and you'll be able to put in. I'll show it to you in a second here. God, I didn't. I didn't think I was going to show this, so sorry. All right, let me get it over here, and I'll do a screen share of it. All right, can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. I see so two circles. You see two circles. So up here on the top. Um, where I can actually down here on the bottom, I can say turn on the points, the labels, the angles, and shade the wood. Okay. Um, and up here in the top right corner, it's telling me the diameter and all the different radiuses and all the different angles. I can crank up the size of this thing, but I can also crank up the number of sides. Right. Um, so it's showing me. For a 26-sided, if I want to make a 26-sided circle, effectively, out of segments, um, that, let's see, these things would need to, I'd need to rip a bunch of pieces that are 1.69 inches wide, and I'd need to cut an angle of something like uh, 6, well, 83.08 degrees on each one. Uh-huh. Right. So how do you measure is, that? Huh? How do you measure that? <laughs> exactly. <Right. laughs> um, but what I want to do is get to the point where I mean, nobody—I don't think anybody's going to do a twenty-six sided, but you might do a, you might do a twelve sided. Yeah. And then I want to add the three D where you can say I want the top radius to be, um, I want the top radius to be this big, and I want it to go down and things like that. So taper, right? Yeah. Now, actually, that's my way of doing a full-size paper plan. So, mm -hmm. yeah, actually, if you read Matthias Wandel's um, article accompanying that uh, software that Matt showed you, he explains that the accuracy isn't actually that critical. There's a very simple way to get around it, and what you do is you assemble it two half circles, yep, and then flatten those on the same way you'd lap the bottom of a hand plane. Yep. So you have two flat planes, and they go together, and you get a seamless joint. Yep. Hmm. And assuming you got everything good enough, when you flatten it, you're not going to remove enough material to make it look like there's a big line. Go you know what I mean? Yes, yeah. You, you, now, you don't want it to look like two halves. <laughs> yeah. You want yeah. it to look like 12, seg 12 equal segments or whatever. Okay. Now, Matt, if you wanted to make that instead of a circle, an ellipse, how do you do that? Yeah, that's, that's, the, next, that's the next piece <laughs> of math there. So. <laughs> I don't even know where I'd start with that. I'd start with the full-size drawing. That's where I'd start. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I found, the, uh, I found the article on the segmented turning. It's uh, It's by Art Breeze. It's Secrets of Segmented Turning. Okay. Um, it's on. It's on the newest fine woodworking. And if you have an online subscription, it's you'll find it under there. It's on under turning, and it's the first one. 
And it says download software to get the size of any type of segment in any type of vessel. Breeze recommends using a computer program. He and his father used table saw miter angles. Twenty dollars at turnwood.com. But he's they, got, they sell it to you? No thanks. <laughs> All right, so what's next for the um what's next for the design jam on your project, Brian? Um what kind of feedback do you want to get? Well, I, I people like the arms, which is good to hear because uh, yeah. there's there's no going back now. <laughs> no, they're, they're... we've already made those cuts. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Cool. All okay. right. So do we want to um, do we want to go to Dale's project or um, I know Rob said he had one too. Yeah. Okay. I don't. Okay. Let's go to Dale's and maybe um, Matt. Do you want to collect Rob's pictures or get them organized? Sure. Um, or get him into the hangout? Sure, that's an even better idea. Uh, I will work on that. Okay. And just wanted to show um, Brian's full size sketch here. If I can find it. It's right here, I do believe. There we go. Brian's been designing this really cool coffee table, which uh, I've been excited about for a while now. I'll just pull it up on screen for you here. Okay. Um, you guys tell me. You guys tell me. Tell Brian what you think of this table. Can you see it there? Do I have it up now? So is that a sitting area and a? That, wait, that can't be a sitting area because the. It's just a like an underneath. It's a table underneath the main table. Like a, a shelf, oh, right? Right. Okay. A shelf. So in the top is going to be made out of uh, the piece that's in my avatar that. Uh, well, so here's the unfortunate piece. That, that, that wedge shape you're using, Apple has a patent on. <laughs> <laughs> that is the MacBook Air coffee table top that Apple yeah. has. You can't use that. Uh, but it wow. doesn't have a crotch in it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to join the table, the, the upper tabletop, to the support? It's. I was. Plan on doing a mm -hmm. through wedged mortise and tenon, okay. so you would see the joint from the top, and it's going to be it's going to be big. I think the 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 stretcher or whatever you want to call it that connects the top to the base. It's like a yeah. leg. That's yeah. a yeah. upright leg. Or... Yeah, it's going to need to be a little bit bigger, probably at each end, um, mm -hmm. to support that to get a like a beefier joint in there. Mm -hmm. um, Chris had a good idea. We were talking about this the other night, and he was saying, "Do a do a tusk tenon through the top." Yeah, I oh, like that, that would idea. Be cool. uh, that would be. I'm, cool. I'm gonna do that. So my idea is to run that tenon right through the top, maybe three or four inches, and then put a wedge on the top to lock it in. You you might have to, right, Chris? Because on that far know. end, away from where the leg joins, you're gonna have so much leverage on that joint. Yeah, mine's going to be a little bit, uh, my top's going to be a little bit farther over towards the right. I'm making gestures with my hands. I know you can't see me. Uh, so there won't be as much cantilever. Won't be as much cantilever. And I'll have that taper as well so that it's lighter at the far yeah. end. And all the weights helping cantilever it back as well. If people put their foot up on that cantilevered end, though, right, there, that weight, that's a... Um, uh, yeah, no, no, that's the beauty of wood, I think, because it'll spring rather than uh, bend and snap or snap like metal or plastic or another material would. Yeah, I'm not worried about the wood breaking. I'm worried about the joint failing. Yeah. Um, and, and okay. Both, yeah. Both ends of it too. Not just it's not just the top. It's both ends of yeah. that joint that you have to worry about. Um, there's some people suggesting yeah. a fox wedge. What's a fox wedge? I don't know if I'm. An open fox, fox wedge. wedge. An open fox wedge, yeah. Now, is that just a regular wedge tenon? Uh, maybe you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but a fox wedge tenon is a blind mortise with wedges inside the tenon, so you never see them. Once it goes together, it's together permanently? Yeah, I, I believe so, and then the tenon spreads out inside the mortise. Right. Right. Um... Uh, gosh, is there a good, is there a good example? I don't want to draw. I'm try and find a picture. Yeah, yeah. Mark Hawkstein's with me here. Uh, here we go. 
I th oh, well, I don't know. I could draw but a picture, I but it would be so bad. <laughs> it would yeah, a blind so fox twitch. Bad. A fox twitch ten is, as far as I can tell, always blind. Um, here's a picture from. Uh, uh, let me just pull it up here. So for a fox wedge tenon, you cut your mortise. There you, go. you got it, Matt? Or okay, I got it. I got it. Okay. You guys can see the picture on my screen. Yeah, that's it. That's perfect. Okay. So th there's a mortise which is not through. Okay. And it's flared out towards the non-through end. And then you have your standard straight tenon with two curves in it for your wedge, two wedges, or one wedge, usually two. And you drive your tenon into the mortise, and as you drive it in, those wedges are driven in. And they expand the top and bottom of that tenon up and down to lock it into the mortise piece. Now, would you, so control, what, would you control the spreading by putting a, like the same way you would when you would wedge it anyway, with a through wedge, and put a, like drill a hole at the end of where you want it to stop? If you if you wanted to, if you wanted to you could do that I don't I, it's a personal preference thing. Your wedges um, have to be cut. Your, your wedges have degree. to be cut perfectly because you can't trim them later, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. once you put that together, it's not coming apart either. Yeah. Without destroying it completely. Yeah. The only way the only way to repair that is to is to destroy it, cut it open. Yeah. Right. So there's no there's, if you do a dry fit, don't put the wedges in. <laughs> Yeah, that would be bad. That would be bad. I kind of like that idea, though, because then I don't have to uh, cut into the top of the table. Because that's not oh. going to be it's not going to be a straight cut through the top of the table. That's that's an angled cut through the top. Yeah. If it's not on, you I mean, you're going to be staring <laughs> at that joint right there. Are you thinking of this, Brian? Are you actually thinking of this blind uh, fox wedge tenon? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to think about that a little bit more because it's gonna be, either way. It's gonna be angled. It's not gonna be a fun. Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah. That's be gonna fun. be a lot of stress. I don't know how it'll handle it. Um, if you do that, I'm gonna call you crazier than me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of which way the tenon would even go through the table. Then would it run lengthwise with the table, or would the tenon be? Perpendicular to the direction of the table. I think the tenon should go parallel yeah, to the major axis of cantilever. You need okay. those shoulders to provide maximum uh, resistance to it coming apart. Yeah. So you need the shoulder. You need the shoulders running parallel to the table. You guys talk amongst yourself. I want to draw something for him real quick. Sorry. Okay. I got to get my Mister Sketch. My pad. Okay. My pad. Oh. Uh, if anybody has any more questions for Brian, can we can you punch them into the uh, tweet chat or Twitter uh, into Twitter using the wood chat uh, hashtag, and we'll ask Brian right now, and then we will move on to where are we going? I guess Rob. We'll move on to Rob's project, then we'll get to Dale's project at the end. Hi, Rob. Want to introduce yourself, sir? <laughs> Sorry, I had it on mute. Can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, said, why, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Rob, and I'm a woodworker. <laughs> Hello, Rob. <laughs> um, uh, this is a busy night for me. I was on uh, Wood Talk Online earlier, and Matt, we were talking about our... Uh, Escapades in Cincinnati last year. Yeah, <laughs> we're probably not all allowed to be in the same city anymore yeah. at the same time. Anyway, are you going to Cincy? Yeah, I'm going to Cincy. Yeah, I'm going to Pasadena. So, I feel like the band broke up. I know it's it's kind of uh, it's a little bit sad, but uh, it's it, it's probably for the best anyway because we'd probably get arrested this year and. 
It'd be no good for anybody. Yeah. Dogs and cats living together. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm done with my um, my kindergarten sure. sketch that I wanted to show you my idea, Brian. Are you ready? Don't laugh, you guys. Okay. Can you can you guys see this here? Uh, okay. Holds down, holds up. Okay. So on the back, so the uh. the uh, the tenon runs. Parallel to the axis, uh, the, the tenon runs this way. Okay. Okay. Now I think if uh, I see this what you're saying there, if it's a if it's a what is it called a fox a foxhole? Fox, fox wedge. wedge. Yeah. Fox wedge. Yeah. That so, would work because it's yeah. not gonna it's not gonna go against. I think Lugi said something about it needs to run perpendicular to the grain of the top so it doesn't split it because. Yeah. When you wedge it, it's gonna wedge the top, or is it just wedging the tenons? When you put wedges in, is it, is it doing so, anything? So I, I, oh. the, the the thing I'm trying to convey here is I, is I don't I don't I don't I'm, I don't have an opinion about what kind of joinery you use here, whether it's just a mortise and tenons, a through tenon, a yeah. uh, tusk tenon, or whatever. My my point is that the top of this leg is very wide. On the back of it. You're holding the back side of the table down. Okay. It's a game of leverage. And yes, and you have a very wide shoulder here. Yeah. And here you're holding the as far forward as you can up. Okay. Right. So that when you if there's a force applied here, not only are you being pushing down against this shoulder, right? But you're pulling, but you're. But you're, you, it's just kind of a leverage game. You know what I'm saying? I'm it's a very, it's it a I very can't. good picture too, though. I'm yeah, really yeah. trying to explain it, and I can't. But you see what I'm saying? No, no, no. I, I completely the understand. The wider this exactly is, and the more yeah. resting surface you have here, yeah, the better. Mm -hmm. Right? If you don't have a lot of resting surface here, then it's all on this joint. Yeah. So sorry. Anyway. Yeah. So that's actually a really good point, Matt. Um, Brian, if you can get that front of that uh, the leg with the upright as far forward as possible, even if it's a very very low profile section, the farther yeah. forward it is, the better just a leverage. Even if curve that comes out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Sweep sweep it into it, blend it into the top maybe, and then I think you'll be setting yourself up God, for that success. Was so bad. That was so bad. That wasn't bad. That was good. That was good, yeah. Matt. You need to keep like a dry erase board next to you. He's got one well, they all, they all have uh, confidential information on them that I can't share. <laughs> Or erase right now, because I got to get that stuff done. So, okay, on to Rob. Rob, take it away, Rob. His last name's Wood. Yeah, it's true. So, um, yeah, I uh, so I did a blog post today where I was sort of alluding to this project that I, or this design that I've kind of had in my head for a long time now, and. Um, Chris, you, I think you may have even posted this on Chatter at one point where, you know, as, as, especially when you're, you're sort of like really deep into design, you, you really never want to sacrifice design based on the limitations of your tools or based on the limitations of your, your skills or techniques. Yeah. And um, I think, so with this particular design, I challenged myself on both those fronts. I didn't know how I was going to do it from a technique standpoint, and I have I still don't know how I'm going to do it from a, a tooling standpoint. That's still wow. a mystery. But That's actually I, cool. Well, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> it's cool if you haven't already burned three prototypes. <laughs> uh -huh. So we um, literally, literally take it out the backyard and set on fire. I, I went camping earlier this year and literally brought one of the prototypes with me and burned it in a sacrificial, you know, funeral pyre. It was a <laughs> ceremony. It was it was quite touching actually. But um so the turning point for me, in fact, what's the easiest way to share this? Should I I could either share it like a SketchUp instance right. on my screen or I could just tweet out a um, you could you could do both. Screen. That way, the people well. who aren't watching the video can see it. And then, if, and you, if you're doing, you do a screen share, it'll be in the video feed. And if you're doing gestures like this, we can see them. 
I like yeah. to do the gestures below the screen, so it just looks like I'm moving away. <laughs> I like using gestures when I'm on phone calls, and I think that people can actually like read my body language. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me just tweet a static, because this is going to be easier if I can rotate it sort of on the video, okay. too. Okay. Screen share. To do it justice. But I'll also tweet out a link to uh, the static page. That was a good job, Rob, uh, building the anticipation. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am in marketing, <laughs> my day job. All right, yeah. so can you see that? I can yes. see that. All right, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So Not this holds a globe. OK, yeah, so I haven't even bothered putting the top but this is basically going to be a, a a side table or an end table, and I haven't even bothered putting the top on there because that's just probably a round mm -hmm. circle, not it's challenging. Um, I was also really limited by my SketchUp abilities in this one as well. But essentially, what it is, so if you think of a classic shaker tapered leg, yeah. Turn it 45 degrees so that you now have sort of like a diamond where you have one of the corners facing you and then two corners on the side and one corner in the back. Okay. And then you bend the whole thing. <laughs> and then you join all three of them in the middle. There's about a one to two inch sort of flat spot on the face of each of those legs where you can see, and this is why I probably want to use glass for the top so you can actually see this joinery straight down. Yeah. Um, the shape of the tops, as you can see it right here, is about what I want it to be. Where my SketchUp limitations were is the bottom of this profile should be reversed, where it's going to actually be narrower oh. than it is wide. And that was where I just couldn't render that SketchUp properly. Mm, okay. Um, but essentially the real challenge here is that you can't use bent lamination, right? Because nope. you'd have the strips going, you know, across and you'd be cutting through the laminations in order to, you know, create mm -hmm. that, that profile. So I think what I'm going to have to do is, is do a steam bending mm -hmm. on oh. these and then profile that that diamond shape and then somehow flatten the backs enough here where they'll have nice clean joints and then I'll just do floating tenons that will hold all three of them together but creating that profile after because if, if I'm gonna do steam bending it pretty much has to be square stock to steam yeah. bend it because I have to have the strap I have to have everything nice and square I don't know how I'm gonna create this profile easily with mm. You know, I could use a handsaw. I can't really use a bandsaw because I have nothing to register those shapes against. <laughs> I could use spoke shaves, but it would take weeks. So I'm like... Steam bend that, you don't think? I don't think I could steam bend it already shaped. Is that what you're saying? I think you might be able to. I'd have to create uh, some... Um, no, just steam bend it square and then profile it. Yeah, I'm just saying it'd be a lot easier to profile it before I bent it, if that's yeah. possible, but I can't think of any reasonable way to do that. Why can't? Why couldn't you steam bend that after you profile it? You're worried about it going on a square? Well, for steam bending, so you have to have, you have to be able to support the outside fibers when you bend it because you don't want the outside fibers to stretch. So right. you really need a big, flat reference surface along the convex side. So I guess in theory I could shape the inside part of that prior to bending it, but you yeah. need it. You have to have a strap along that back. So you, what you if need you all the bending to, um, to happen in compression. What if you were to do a... On, on, the, on the strap... What if you were to cut a piece that had a complementary angle and cut curves in it so it could bend? 
right? So, so it would. Hmm. So, you would shape the wood as it's straight. Mm -hmm. You'd steam it. You you'd put it around that put it around the shape. You'd then put a that backing support piece that had the complementary angle cut into it, that had curves cut in it, so it would so it would bend, and then you strap it up. Uh, that would potentially work. Uh, I would just have to have so the bending form would also have to sort of yes. somehow conform to the inside well, of this could, curve. It's the isn't it the same curve on the same radius on each side, just further out? I mean, no. it's not. See, if you look at it from a profile standpoint, it actually tapers quite a bit. Yeah, but it's the same on the back side of the curve, right? Oh, wait, oh, uh, no. But what if you, when you made your when you made your mold, so let's say you made your form out of MDF. If you stacked a couple of pieces of MDF and made it, uh, you know, like two and a half inches thick or whatever, cut that shape, that tapered shape, into it or out of it, so that you had both sides of the form with that cut. That wouldn't work. I'm not sure. I completely. Follow your. You're looking oh, for to draw a picture again. You're looking for support no, no, no. on uh, on both <laughs> sides of the piece. Correct. That's what it is. When you clamp it to bend it, you're looking for support on both sides of the piece. Um. So I really only need a form for this inside radius. Yeah. The outside, I need to have a. You usually have a metal strap yeah. that will go around it. Yeah. And you need to be able to support just the fibers. So the benefit of the me metal strap is that it supports the ends of the wood as well as it bends. So it supports the wood as it bends as opposed to having a concave mold pressing against it. And that would, there's a chance that the fibers could uh, split hmm. and it, it could ruin the, the, the bend because they're not supported during the you whole way. You don't support way. them, they'll do this. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I so the, the term for that. The whole idea. So think of it this way: wood. When you when you steam bend wood, um, it won't flex. You can't stretch wood very effectively, but you can compress it dramatically. Mm -hmm. So you want to. You have to have a stop basically at the top and the bottom, and a strap along the back side, so that the back side of this is the same length as the piece of wood you start with. The inside compresses dramatically. So you have to have something. Yeah, I guess it it doesn't need to support those wood fibers a ton on the back. It's more just compressing the top and the bottom. So if I can find a way to do the you know make the form so that it will receive this you know funky yeah angle, then I might be able to do it after shaping. It would certainly be a whole lot easier if I could shape yeah. and taper this before bending it because trying to do that after bending it is going to be a ton of work even for three legs. Yeah. Wood Shaver says a, a positive negative form yeah. uh, to clamp it in. I think, I think maybe that pink foam might help, dude. That's what I was trying to say, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, this is going to have to go into some kind of form after I bend it. I mean, you can't just plop this into a form to begin with. You have to apply a ton of leverage to actually bend it in yeah, the first you're, place. You're like, you're like ratcheting a clamp, band clamp on this thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you're bending it around a form with a lot of force. But then once it's set, then I have to put it on a drying form as well. So that could be where I could use sort of a positive and negative form to just yeah. you know, mm -hmm. put it in the drying form and leave it for a few weeks. <laughs> but this is definitely well, not um, not your standard project by any means. So it's any suggestions anyone has they want to send in on Twitter, I am completely open to How about that uh, Chris, uh, how, about that, how about that cold bend stuff that uh, Scott brought up brought up. What's that? That wacky wood that you can order. Oh right, right, right. Yes. Um Yes. No, but there is. I'm trying to remember the name of it. There, there is a a uh, a product out there that is a. They basically they. They steam it. it they compress it. 
Yeah, they they compress it like to a crazy degree, um, and then it's basically you know flexible. They keep it moist, and it, it's not until it actually yeah sort of dries out that it sets. They so ship that it might to you. Be, they ship it to you like vacuum packed like a steak. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really really expensive is the downside to yeah. it, but for something like if it's if it's gonna save me like you know fifteen hours of labor or twenty mm -hmm. hours of labor, then that would easily mm -hmm. justify. It would be cool if you could shape that while it was still flexible. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you can, can do that. You can. Um, it says you can resaw it and saw it. You can't use routers or shapers or a planer, like a mm -hmm. like a bench planer. You know, Rob, one thing about having a, a drying form um, that was well built is that it would, it would help you understand, because this has to be made pretty precise. Yep. And so the drawing form would be a way to make sure that the pieces were consistent. Yeah, and that's kind of the whole point of the drying form is you won't get any spring back. Yeah. That's kind of the big downside to steam bending. Um, is you you know you get spring back if you if you do a you know a bent lamination that's where at least the technique I've I've ended up using I get no spring back on a bent lamination at all I get no no glue creep. Yeah. Now, why couldn't so you that do was, a bent lab for that? Well, essentially, you'd have to cut to to do the this diamond shape on the top. I'd have to start cutting through each of the laminations, and it would weaken those glue bonds. Mm -hmm. So, my concern is that they really wouldn't be, you know, particularly strong glue bonds after I shaped it. And uh, I'm not, I'm not convinced, Rob, but sure. Um, your call. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I haven't. I honestly, I haven't tried it. Yeah. Um. I mean, that is that is typically the the one big downside to doing, um. You know, a uh, a bent lamination is that that you you really shouldn't or can't shape it after the fact because you start cutting through. You know those those glue bonds, so you have a very I mean, I guess I'd I'd have to think about how I would orient the grain, um, but you would also you would you'd be showing every single one of those glue lines across I both think of these. If you chose if you chose your glue right and your stock right, I think you could make it pretty darn visible, if not invisible. If you laminated it, yes. Yeah, I just think it would look so cool if it was a bent piece. Yeah, on screen right now I have. Um, Cold bend, which is that uh, wood that's uh, compressed. Um, it's at flutedbeams.com slash chidwick order page. And I dropped a link into the Twitter chat there. Um, quite interesting stuff. I know some people who have worked with it. I've never worked with it myself, though. But it looks like really, it's, it's a radical concept. It'd be really interesting to try, actually. I think Chris Schwarz did. Did he? Okay. Yeah, I'll try and find. I'll try and find the link. Yeah, I know that the only real big downside to it is just the cost. It's it's yeah. really really expensive. Uh, for species group one, it's 1875 per linear foot, and it and it goes up to 3250 per linear foot for walnut. Uh, what type of wood have you got there, Rob? Or are you planning well, on making that from? I was planning to use ash. Um, I just bought a whole bunch of wet ash, anticipating I was going to be steam bending okay. it. So, okay, so ash is in species one, so it's eighteen seventy-five per linear foot. Um, ash, red oak, soft maple, sassafras, and white oak for that price. And for twenty-five dollars, you can have hard maple, hickory, cherry, or sycamore, and walnut for thirty-two fifty. There you go. I will definitely check that out, and I'd be really curious to see what you know what woodworking properties it has before you bend it. Because if I can, mm -hmm. you know, joint it and you know taper it before yeah, I, it sets, I, that would be a interesting. I know option. that it said you can do everything to it. You can saw it. You can use it with a table saw, band saw, um, a jointer. They did say not a planer. I don't know why you'd be able to use a jointer, but not a planer. But you can't use a planer, and you can't use a router because they'll have way too. I bet, much it, I bet it wouldn't feed through the planer. It'd probably just knot up in there. 
<laughs> oh, here's your, uh, here's Chris's be uh, flapping all around. Yeah, here's Chris's. Bo- it's like trying to put a French fry through a keyhole. Um, <laughs> so here's a uh, here's Chris's blog on the um, on the cold band. It's a couple. It's a couple years old. Um, it's kind of like a flexible drinking straw. He says so. Um, I do, I thought he did a video, not just. Um, and there is a different website to get this. It's uh, I'll put that in the. Uh, I'll put that in there, in the in the Twitter feed as well. But. Yeah. Basically says. Um, it, when it dries when it dries down, it retains its shape. You can bend it cold, and you're good to go. So. Rob, on your legs, um, what is the overall height of them and how much curvature is in the legs? Uh, I should have brought the template up with me. I've actually I, I made a template out of MDF before I even went to SketchUp, which sounds sort of counterintuitive, but it's, I believe, about... F- it's probably like 26 inches tall, and the curve probably spans about... And I think I know where you're going. It's probably... I think my original plan was to try to be able to cut it out of a, an eight-inch wide piece of stock so that the curve okay. would fit within eight inches. But it was uh, the reason I ended up scrapping that idea is because of the the short grain run out problem I would have. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Mark Cherry Wood Shaver One Hundred and One brought up the same point, which, which I should have thought of um, to find the piece of wood with that grain and just cut it from solid wood one piece. That would be that would be ideal if I could just find like a crazy you know I should go to Home Depot I'm sure they <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm sorry the big box store that I didn't I didn't mention any brands um yeah I mean half the poplar I buy I just send it through my uh, you know I just yeah. rip it in half and it bends almost that much <laughs> no that's a really um, good idea <laughs> are you set are you set on ash I'm sorry. Are you set on using ash for the t- for the table? No, I mean the reason I was going down that route is that I had I have just you know wet, okay. you know air dried ash available to yeah. me and and it steam bends well. So that was just because I, I was think, going down that path. I think you could find a piece of wood that would provide you three curved legs like that if the curve isn't isn't too too severe. Yeah, if I could find you know why it would have to be pretty wide. It would have to be an eight inch wide board with that kind of curve. Right. Um, so if anybody out there has that kind of piece of stock, <laughs> I've got a few that meet that description. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll talk after then. Yeah. Rob, do you have a uh, online subscription to Fine Woodworking? I do. Yeah. There's one I just found. It's Tapered Laminations uh, Made Easy by Michael Fortune, and he actually talks about uh, um. Incorporating tapered curved laminations in your furniture opens up an incredible range of designs. However, tapering the component after it has been laminated has two disadvantages. If too many glue lines are broken, then the part will begin to straighten. Also, the severed glue lines are likely to show a series of ugly lines. Yeah, so that's individual well, plies yeah. on the front and back, on the inside and outside of the curves yeah. that you see yeah. continuous. But you'd be angling, right? Because it's a diamond, though. Right. Yeah. It's it's kind of a different challenge. You can yeah. you can get away with that if you're doing sort of a traditional tapered, you know, leg. Mm-hmm. Um, you can actually you 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 produce each of your laminations tapered in mm-hmm. what he's describing. Mm-hmm. So you, there's actually a jig you can do so that your laminations are each tapered. So you end up with, yeah. you know, a tapered end product. But it's you really can't create a square lamination and then taper it on two planes after the fact for the very reason he just described. You start cutting through all those glue lines and that weakens the whole the whole thing. Because oh, you gotta right. keep in mind with a with a with a with that kind of lamination you're you have a piece that's constantly in tension. Even, you know, a hundred years later, each one of those laminations is still in tension. It's it's only the glue that's keeping them you know, rigid. Whereas if you do a steam bend, it has no memory. Once you actually bend it and dry it, it's it has no recollection of the shape or or you know form it used to have. One so last is, idea for you, Rob. Yep. If you laminate it 
and then you shape it and expose all those ugly glue lines, and then you veneer it. Oh, that's very interesting. Because yeah, uh, it's it's not flat. it's not really the aesthetics I was worried about with with the, okay. um, the lamination. You know, with the lamination, it was more the the structural integrity. Because yeah, I could totally do that. I mean, I, I even I I so two of the the models I burned already were sort of stacked laminations. I tried to do this with a stack lamination, and it yeah. just it blew up on me every time I tried to shape it. That was yeah. I I would say a miserable failure. Yeah. I'll get there. It's my Moby Dick. Yeah. <laughs> so when do you expect to be to begin this project to start building the actual one? Is it going to be a month down the road, or a year, or I'm not sure. I've, I have um, I have a bid out on a on a commission right now, and it depends on whether that comes in or not. If it doesn't, this will probably be my my next project or the next one after that. I also the the same guy I bought all the uh, wet ash from. I also got this really cool piece of um, walnut crotch slab that uh -huh. is just dying to be made into something, but. This will this will happen, you know, this fall. You got to ask a wood guy for a piece of curved wood. Yeah, he di I I didn't I didn't see any, or I would have snatched that up yeah. in a heartbeat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, so Mark Cherry had an idea. What about cutting the curve out of solid maple? Or sorry, what about cutting the curve out of solid and make mirror images, and then glue them down the center like the drawing? Right. Okay. So you'd you'd make three rights and three lefts, and then glue them together. That is actually a really cool idea. If I can, that may actually be an interesting solution I hadn't thought of. That's kind of like a Moser technique. So you even have like, especially if you could book match them, so you'd have yes. like mirror grain left to right. Um, that's that's a really cool idea that I'm gonna. I'm Definitely con think about. I'm confused. How does that help your problem? Um, well, it, yeah, it would still you'd still have the short grain issue, um, but you wouldn't. You could you could get away with a well, not if you're book batching it, but yeah. you could get away yeah. with using you know like four quarter stock instead of eight quarter stock. It'd be easier yeah. to find something that you could sort of line it up with. I like the idea. I mean, it would certainly be easier to work the two sides, but getting them to match might be tricky. Yeah. If you had, um, so okay. imagine if you had a router sled. You, you you might have to get custom bits made, but you could you could um, <laughs> you could steam bend a piece, right? Put it in the router sled. Have that router cut the front side of the leg. Have that router cut the back side of the leg. Um, and you'd have you'd have to have two router sleds, a, a, a right and a left, <laughs> and then you'd have to have custom router bits made, and then you'd have to, and then you'd have to, and then you'd have to. I'm surprised. Jeez. Where's Bill Griggs' tweet that says, "Just send them to me, and I'll see them for you." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Matt, to your point, though, I mean, like, so steam bending in theory solves my problem of actually, you know, getting the rough shape. So yep. if I can, you know, steam bending is potentially the solution in terms of just technique, but shaping it, that's, you know, that's where it's either going to be a lot of work with a handsaw or, you know, so if there is or something I could do, have to make. Yeah. or yeah, or a jig, that's where, and especially if this is a one-off, like I hate building a jig for anything I'm only building one of, and I'm not probably going to build more than one of these. Yeah, but you're, you're building three legs. You're building twelve faces. Right? Yeah. No, nope, that's true. I mean, that you could even true. use a, you could even use a straight bit and run the router on the sled at an angle. You don't have to set the router down flat, right? And that's the way you could do it. Like, um, I can I can never say his name, but M Matthias Wandel, he ha he has a router table where he can move the 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 router so. If he wants an odd angle, he doesn't have to buy the bit. He can use a straight bit and tilt the router. Yeah, replicator, I think it is. What'd you, what'd you say? A replicator? Is that the one, the 3D well, replicator? No, he, he actually does this no. exactly just on his router table. He can just okay. 
tilt his router. But he does have the oh. like the router pantograph okay. and yeah. all these yeah. other things. Yeah. Yeah, like like a tilting head shaper, but with the router. Yeah. So, and if yeah. so if you have the router pointing down, you could set you could you could set whatever angle you wanted for the face. Yeah. And if you just had a if you just had a um a form for it to follow, you could yeah. cut Yeah. Yeah. Well, for the record, I never tried to freehand cut one of those blanks on my bandsaw. Never never tried that. That would be very dangerous. Yeah. Oh, the bevel. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, that was like five minutes of, oh, my God, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in the shop, trying to like. Yeah. <laughs> Bill just sent it. He goes, just send them to me, and I'll see and see them for you. <laughs> I, I like this idea before. Um, put, a, put a layer of carbon fiber in the middle. I just need a 3D printer, and then all my problems are solved. Yeah, that uses uh, wood, like wood cellulose as the medium. Yeah. Right. You're building some MDF furniture now, are we, Rob? Yeah, you just give it a big hop. You just give it a big hopper of ash wood pulp. <laughs> Come on, table. Matt, get your uh, employer on that. Yeah, we're working on it. Yeah. yeah. Now, Rob, how far are you away from maybe saying just doing it by hand? Is it? Do you think you'd be able to get the three pieces similar enough? I mean, you know, the the only place that there's real precision involved is where they meet. You know where that joint happens, and that's it's like a one and a half to two inch flat spot, and I could do that with hand planes, no problem. Yeah. Um, the rest of it, yeah, I absolutely could do by hand, and my initial thought was to do that by hand. Um, mm -hmm. It's just that it's ash, and that's you know, I don't know how much you've Never used hand tools ash. on ash. It's it's not that fun. No. It's a pretty hard, dense wood, but I maintain it smells like baking cookies when you're when you're milling it. Yeah, I gotta I gotta try that out. I don't. If anybody knows cookies, it's me. And I, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of cookies? What kind of cookies are we talking? I like chocolate chip cookies. The stuff smells awesome when you're really? when you're cutting it. Yeah, better than better than walnut. Yeah, yeah. It's it's my favorite wood smell in the shop is ash, yeah. There's too many jokes there, I know. <laughs> it I smells like, it when like you ash. Say wet ash. <laughs> <laughs> Rob is telling us about wet ash. I knew this was going nowhere good. <laughs> so you're still completely up in the air. You're not leaning one way or the other with this. You're just, it's, it's not close enough to that point where you have to make a decision just yet. No, I mean, I honestly, I, I I first came up with this design almost six months ago, and I've been noodling on it since then. I've gone through, like I said, two to three prototypes, and I'd sort of given up on it. And then I was at Fine Woodworking Live, and I was in Michael Fortune's session on on hmm. bending, and he went through steam bending, and I said, you know what? That's the solution right there. I can steam bend it. So that solves one of my two major issues. Uh, I still haven't solved the second one, but at the end of the day, just brute force, I know I could do it. I just mm -hmm. can't do it cost effectively. Yeah. Are you making more than one of these? or? Just um, you know what? If I could make more than one of them pretty easily, I probably will. I bought enough ash that I could probably make, you know, a good half dozen of these just okay. using rifts on for the legs. If I want to get into the center of the board, I could make even more of them. So... If if I end up going down the jig route or you know something like that, then I'll make more than one. But it's guess, more of a challenge than yeah. anything else. This isn't for a client. This isn't you know. I'll yeah. probably just bring this to a show. Mm -hmm. um, only woodworkers will appreciate it. <laughs> no one else will really yeah. care because they yeah. won't understand the challenges behind it. Hmm. That's all I have for ideas for you, Rob. <laughs> Make it out of solid wood. That's what I say. No, you know what, Chris? You're going to end up going and like building this this weekend, and then posting <laughs> pictures of it just to make me look yeah. like an idiot. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could. <laughs> but Chris will find a piece of wood that's gigantic, and he'll carve yeah. all three legs out of it, and they won't have to be glued together. Yes, I and can he'll do remove that. all the wood with hand tools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's hey, that's an idea, Rob. You could do that. Just get a big log and start carving. And just carve the whole thing from one log. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, it still has that short grain problem, but. Yeah. Well, well, I appreciate you this guys square... entertaining yeah. this crazy notion I have. No, I mean, that's what the design jams are for is to get feedback and then, you know, I, I think it's interesting when we help people figure out, okay, how, how would I actually build this? Because one of the topics we talked about last week was elevating your woodworking, and it was like, take on projects you're not sure you can actually do. Yeah. Right? And force Check. yourself to go finish them. So, um, so I think it's interesting. I think I think there were some good ideas, and it, it's I don't know. I don't know, man. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you have to. When I finally do build it, invite me back on, and and uh, we will. We on. will. Yeah. So here's here's what you have to be be ready for, though. Like you said, only woodworkers would appreciate it. Let's say you put it in a show and you get twenty orders. <laughs> You're gonna have to figure out a repeatable process that doesn't make all your hair go away. Yeah, one thing I'm getting really good at these days is saying no. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, folks, what do you think? Should we wrap it up? Yeah. We're past seven. We are. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else, guys? Uh, not that oh, I can think of. Poke surprise, or you know, okay. Yeah, I, I was looking for uh, any more questions and stuff, but uh, I think we're pretty good. So I think we'll do Dale next week Yes. for the Design Jam and probably yeah. try to get a photo gallery together. I might just FedEx him a webcam. Um, <laughs> and, ah. Chris, I think we should talk about those rules that you found next week too. Sure. Ten, cool. What were they? Ten rules for something, yeah. Yeah, ten rules for students at the... Immaculate Heart College of Art. <laughs> yes. Or as I call them, 10 rules of life. Yeah, they pretty pretty much are. Pretty much Rule are. number four, everything is an experiment. And That's Rob has rule. three failed experiments. <laughs> <laughs> but he's working towards a solution, so. Yeah. He didn't do it with his uh, project material, though, right? He didn't do it with Ash, did you? Or the experiments with Ash? Well, for me, Ash is a project. Like, Ash is, it's like three bucks a board foot. It's okay. kind of throwaway. Okay, cool. Yeah. All that cookie smell for cheap. <laughs> I know, right? All right, All right everybody. Well, I think that's going to wrap up Wood Chat for August 29th, 2012. Uh, we are on Twitter at uh, hashtag Wood Chat. You can chat with us anytime. Uh, if you want to make it easy to follow along in the conversation, because the conversation continues. Even when WoodChat enters, it goes on um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can go to uppercutwoodworks.com slash woodchat slash chatroom. Uh, the most recent video is always on that page. And the, uh, the Twitter stream for the hashtag WoodChat is always on that page. So anytime you need help uh, with a woodworking project or you just want to chat with other woodworkers, head over there and make it happen. And we'll see everybody next week. All right. Good night. Bye, everybody.